first of all, I would like to, slightly belatedly by one day, wish you a very, very happy 100th birthday. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about yourself to start off? I mean, I know that you were born somewhere in this vicinity. You might talk a little bit about your parents. And I know your dad was in the First World War. Is there anything you'd like to say? Before we go on to your main story, yeah. would you like to tell us something yeah. about that? Well, I didn't know very much about the First World War because my father never discussed it. And um, he, uh, he was bent on working, like, to keep us going, wasn't he? Four of us. And he worked in John Summers and Sons. And what happened there, see, was the fact that uh, he'd been wounded in World War I in the shoulder here. And I, I, I often looked at that, seen that uh, hole in his shoulder. You know, I, I couldn't understand that. Anyway, that's how we come out of World War I, with a bullet hole in his, in his thigh. Uh, he worked in some of this for a while, you know, and brought us up, we were in some of this, and uh, he got burned in some of this, and uh, he contracted uh, pneumonia, and he died. Nothing could save him, and there's a big hole in our, my family life, because, you know, my mother and, and uh, the well, four of us. Anyway, we ploughed through it off and on, i done a little bit of uh, scrumping and uh, I, had about, I, had three, I had three jobs when I was 14 and uh, it was all to the good, you know, it was all little bits and pieces going in to help my mother. And then I got a job in Courtauld's. That was a job. I'd tried for, uh, for months and months and months to get a job there. I was told one morning to go back and tell your mother to put you under the mantle. I never forgive that fellow for that after that. Aye. Uh, he, he said, uh, go home and tell your mother to put you under the mantle before you come to work here, you know. I go, bugger him. I never went near the place. All I did then was that I went to Castle Works. I went to Deeside Mill at Upper Works. And... Uh, that was the end of that till I got called up. I got called up to the spinning room. And it was no fancy job, the spinning room in court halls. You had no gloves to put on, you had no specs to put on your face. You had to put your hands in the acid to get the filament from the jet, you know, the jet come out. And it coagulated and uh, it, uh, it went into, made it into a viscose, viscose thread. And that's what they produce in, in Castle Works, viscose threads. And that went on for a couple of years, you know, until we, the war come around. Lads were going away to the war, leaving the place, you know. And I thought, when was it going to be my turn, like, you know. Because by then I'd reached a reasonable job. Um, anyway, the time come round when I was in the spinning room. My mother brought me brown letter from home. I knew what it was because the lads that were working there received these particular letters, you see, for calling up. I, I was, I was, I went to the foreman and said, bloody hell, Arthur, he said, they're going to put you in the RAMC. I said, what's that? I put him with the RAF, you know, and, uh, he said, oh, they're going to make a doctor out of you. I thought, you know, I just had to laugh in his face, like, because being a doctor, like, you some somebody there, like, wasn't you? And uh, that was it. From there, I was in work on a Sunday morning. I was in South Wales on Wednesday afternoon. But uh, the 53rd Welsh Division... They were operating down there, you know. And uh, that went on, a little bit of training that was done there. And then the 53rd 
moved over to, to Ireland and uh, finished the training in Ireland. Went to, uh, over the mountains of Marne, walking. Well, you had to walk, didn't you? <laughs> and uh, funny, you know, I'd never been to Ireland before and it's all little cobble streets and, uh, well, cobble uh, rivers, you know. And, uh, and uh, I was walking there one morning, on a Sunday morning, and uh, there was a fella on one of the bridges, the small bridges there, you know, with little pebbles. And he hit his head in the wall, and he was bleeding, you know. I thought, hell, I'll have to do something to, for this chap, right? Mm. So that's what I did. I cut my first field dressing, from my leg, which you you should never do. That was for your own use. I cut it out. I bandaged him up. Made him look respectable to go back home. Thanks very much, lad, he said. I said, that's all right. But that same su Sunday morning, I was on church parade, wasn't I? We had church parade all a Sunday morning. Uh, all You know, everybody had to go. Shoes had to be popped, brasses had to be clean, you know, everything had to be spot on. And I went, I was on parade, and the old RSM come along and he seen, what's that fella doing with that? Uh, what I did, I, I, cut the, I cut the bandage out, I mean, first, you know, to get the first field dressing, you had to cut the bandage out, see? It was a Vaseline gauze dressing. Anyway, I cut it out, bandaged him up, sent him on his way. Thanks very much. And I never thought anything of it, like, you know, just a slit down, down, down the trousers. Went up on parade. He's the ice sergeant major coming along with the captain. What's that doing there, like that, he said to me. I bandaged the lad up, fell up. You got no bloody business to bandage him up, he said. It's for your own use. And uh, I got seven days CB for that. <laughs> Cleaning all the football gear <laughs> for seven days. I used to play football myself for the regiment, see. And uh, that's how I started off. But she never stopped training, like, you know. The 29 and a half mile was the furthest I ever went on a route march. 29 and a half mile. And uh, that was it. But I uh, carried on the training and uh, found myself in hospital. I had thyroid, thyroid uh, operation. And uh, I'd, be, I'd never had any trouble with it since, you know. Mm. You know. And uh, when you went into hospital during World War Two, you were sent to a holding depot. After you finished your hospital um, treatment, you lost your regiment. You know, and it was a it was a hell of a blow, really, because you know I'd been brought up with that regiment, Fifty Third Welsh Division, and. Uh, from there it went on, turning all over the place, South Wales, up in Scotland, everywhere. Then went, was sent on a, on a, on a ship in Stranra. The SS Wallendam it was called, it was a Dutch ship, and it was being used for transporting troops, you know, from one place to the other. Anyway, I found myself on that, didn't I? I thought, bloody hell. And uh, no arguments, get on. You know, that's how it was. And uh, I said, I'd never been on a ship the size that I went on, you know, it was a real big ship, the Volendam, SS Volendam. And uh, that was it. I went out on a convoy with this Volendam. Uh, Went uh, 
right around South Africa, you know, Cape Town, Durban, Freetown, all them places, you know, places I'd never heard of, you know. And uh, I found myself in Egypt, didn't I? And uh, I seen a hospital ship going out from Cape Town and uh, all lit up, you know, it's marvellous to see it. It's all lit up everywhere. He did respect the hospital ship, the, the, the jerry, you know. And uh, went up to, uh, made our way up the side of uh, South Africa, past uh, Freetown, Cape Town, Durban, all, all up the coast until we got into the, um, the what do you call it, the Mediterranean Sea, past, uh, past that way. Uh, the we landed Red, the, in the Red Sea, uh, yeah. Landed in, in, in Egypt then, and uh, we'd done our training, hadn't we? Next thing was, in an action uh, squadron. But uh, that was a start. I, we hadn't, that's the only little bit of action I had. Uh, it was bandaging this. He was my first army casualty, the first one. After that, I don't know, did not I? But um, he, uh, I always forget that. You always remember that fellow, you know. Yes. And he come back and, and remembered me. What can I do for you, lad? He said. I said, you can't do very much the way I am. <laughs> Stuck in a barracks, orange, an orange barracks. They were all orange barracks there then. Aye, that's what I found myself after in Egypt, finishing the training off in Alexandria. And then I was a member of the, the Eighth Army. I'm, I'm with the, the Eighth Army all the way through the desert. And all the time it was in the desert, the desert rats. And you know, it's funny. We had a W on here in the beginning, the Welsh Division, see. We had to take it down. We had to put a TT on. Didn't go down very well, though. That was the Tyne and Tees regiments. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that was the commencement of my action in World War II. And it continued for six and a half years. Well, six years, the other half of the year was waiting to get demobbed and that, yeah. Lying in Schleswig Holstein in Germany. Waiting to be much demobbed. Yes. The longest wait in my life, huh? Mm, I bet. Uh, Tell us um, a bit more about your desert experience, because I mean, you am I right in thinking you came across Montgomery? No. Oh. No. Every, everybody, you know, talking how good Montgomery was and all the rest of it. The lads I was with would give you a different version altogether. Really? Yeah. Uh, he was always in his caravan about five miles behind the lines. He used to go in his caravan, you see. Oh, he had all the best treatment, didn't he, lad? Hmm. Ah, uh, the caravan. Well, that went on, didn't it, for a couple of years. Getting run up and down Egypt. Till in the end we run him out. I nearly got captured in Benghazi. 20 minutes I'd have been captured. Because Durner, a place called Durner, where we were operating from, it's down an incline, you know, like, like the side of a mountain. And to get up, you go up to a winding road, up to Tripoli. And uh, we were told to get out as quickly as possible, you know. And uh, we got hammered, like. Because the shells were falling, you see. He was trying to cut the path off, wasn't he? Trying to cut the road off. Anyway, I managed to get out. One hell of a dash down the, down the desert road. Everything was moving. You know, the uh, tanks were moving down. 1,500 weight lorry. Everything was moving down. And that's when they went right down. But we'd been up before then, you know. And uh, everything was moving down, and um, 
we weren't uh, stopped in uh, in the other side of Benghazi for the, for the time being. That's where a fellow lost his. Well, he never lost it. He buried, he got it buried in the sand. He had a glass eye, <laughs> and uh, he used to put it in a, in, a, in his tin mug. You see, at night time. Because, you know, you get sand and it grits at the back of your eye, innit? And he used to put it in there. And I was telling a lot. They say it doesn't rain in, 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 in Africa, but this particular night, he put his glass eye in the, in the car, in, in, the, in his cup, and uh, it, it hammered down that particular night, and the sides fell in. So we had to get out and we were soaking very well. We had to get out and get into a bigger tent. The next morning we went there digging it out. Had a job to find it, didn't he? <laughs> you know, all the sides had gone in and... No joke, like, you know, it's, uh, he was there scraping away and... Chaffee, look, I've lost my eye, he said. I said, well, you can see me, can you? Because he had one eye, didn't he? I... Money old chapter. So you never found it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I used to carry a chameleon about with me. Because when we, two of us, put a tent up in the desert, it was a, a little part each. And we used to put it up, see, over the hole. And while you were in the hole, like, you were pretty safe unless you got a direct hit. And, um, it wasn't too bad. But that went on for a while, getting run up and down the desert. So what did the chameleon do? What what did the chameleon do? What did the chameleon do? Oh, he, he, I lost him. Uh, he went... He's more or less a... He, he wasn't a bad chap, old part trust in his name was. <laughs> and... Uh, did he not catch flies? Oh, I well, that was the trouble, wasn't it? The, the German been in these holes, and we went in the holes with all flies, wasn't it? That was one of our biggest troubles. Catching flies off, you know, yes. knocking them off. Yes. But, uh, you used to have a fly net. Wrap yourself up in a fly net. I, I managed to get all of a, what do you call it? Uh, Soup, a pot of soup. You oh. mentioned uh, that you had to rescue someone in the oh, Gatara I... Depression. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know whether you'd like to tell us about that. Yeah. Um, you left really on your own to do operation. On my particular job, it was sort of different to the infantry, you know, because it was... There were three infantry units with one brigade. And uh, each, each brigade was attached to a, a unit, you see. Mm -hmm. But, um, oh, it was life. You see now other people lived. While we were in Egypt, we went to uh, the top of pyramids and Sphinx and that all up. But the, the the best one was uh, what do you call it, Tormina in in Sicily, and we we had to go up to Mount Etna as part of the training to keep you fit. That's what they said, we keep you fit. The ward the ward finished, we'd run them out, you see. And uh, we were there waiting. That's where we lost a lot of lads. But the old captain from Flint come there, a new one, hadn't been in any, anything at all. Come there, started ordering us about different places, you know. Put us on the side of a hill, you know. There's the hill there, and there's Jerry there, you know. Oh, I had it directed. And lads used to sleep under the lorry, you see, and in the lorry, I used to sleep in a, in a, in a hole. I think that's what saved my life. Because mm. I'd been used to sleeping in a hole in the desert. Yes. 
So, it's uh, it gave me the insight on different countries, you know. Mm. But uh, I I didn't know it'd be during peacetime, you know, because the film was on a money. Mm. You know, that was the one thing that stood out a mile when we done the invasion. The one on Sicily wasn't too bad. We lost a few lads. And then we went up from there through the Mediterranean and uh, made a landing in Italy with the lads, Desert Rats. And uh, we come back off there and uh, took us right down to the Tour of France. We'd run them out, see. And that's when we started the, uh, the invasion of France. There were units that went into France, were all trained, highly mobile, you know. And I uh, just counted myself as one. Well. Spotter planes telling you what was going on below, carrying people, going out and bringing them in. Uh, to, it was experience, you know, to mm. perform. You, and something like it, you, you, you'd never come across again. No. That's what your, your paper says, isn't it? Mm. You wouldn't find a fella carrying another one all oh, two and a half miles on a stretcher, would you? While they could get it on a, on a lorry or something like that. Yeah. That's how it finished up. Uh, you, waiting was the thing. You landed at Normandy, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. D-Day, 6th of June. Well, it was a hell of a morning, let's put it that way. And we were a mile out on the LCT, LC, LCI, Landing Craft Infantry. And we were well out. And uh, the assault boats come in and uh, picked us up from the, from the LCI, you see, so that they could get onto a flat bottom finish surface on the, on the beach. And uh, I've never seen fellas uh, afraid because we'd done two others, hadn't we? We'd done one in Sicily and one in Italy, you see. Mm. And uh, there was one case where we, where we did uh, fear for our, our lives. He got on a, on a, a boat in, in, after we'd got into Sicily. And uh, he was, we all had to be quiet, like to go into the into these landings. He didn't have to cause any trouble or anything like that. But this particular lad, big maze of mine, he was nice lad. He used to write every night to his girlfriend, and his mother got a letter one morning before we went into Sicily. He used to give us these letters. Because it sort of booked you up, you see. Mm -hmm. That was the idea of it. All, all the letters. And his mother told him that an American had run off with his girl. You've never seen anything like it in all your life. Mm -hmm. We had to be quiet, and we go on in? And he was shouting and bawling. In the end, like a fellow had to go and sort of keep him quiet with the pain. That lad got killed, mm -hmm. you know. Just as well because he, his life would have been different. Uh, after that, it was just France, wasn't it? Uh, on D Day. It was a hell of a morning, as I say. And uh, we were getting tossed about because we were only on the small boat, see? The assault boat. The, the other one was a big boat that would come on LTI. Yes. And there was landing craft tanks. Landing craft this, landing craft that, you know. So, but uh, when I look back at it now and see the uh, the operation as it went, massive operation, you know, all you could see was boats. But one thing we couldn't see was what was on the side of us, you know, and uh, television comes up sometimes with the, what was on the side 
and, and I could see like where that where I was and what I was doing, you know. But uh, it took us a while to get to to Khan, and then it was just one slug after one. Uh, but to, on the beach itself, it's let uh, the book in there, D.D. Landings. It's a universal book. Yes. And in that book, there's a paragraph where a, a, an officer was coming along the beach. And he said, he seen to me, he seen me bandaging a lad up on the beach on the 6th of June. You know, just at the top of the beach. I said, you're doing a good job there, lad, he said. Uh, you know. But uh, 50, 50 yards up the road after that, found him dead. That's how it was. Yeah. You were seeing people, and then they were, you know, they were dying. Uh, but he took all particulars of what I was doing, under fire, like, you know. Could have been knocked off a few times. And uh, was, he put it in that book. I didn't know one of my mates that lives in South Wales. He got that book and sent it for me. Mm -hmm. And there's just a paragraph about that much of it, telling you about what I was doing. Man from Flint, they called me. <laughs> uh, man from Flint. But uh, things went after that, you know. Normally, you had the old bombardments and bombing. Went going through all. You know, I'll, I'll never forget the faces of these people. They'd been under the armour for six and a half years, hadn't they? You know. Mm. And when we went, were going through these little villages and towns, we were throwing stuff at us, you know, throwing all sorts of stuff. Yes. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I don't know, it gave me more encouragement when I seen how these people were, you know. Yes. And that was the same everywhere we went, mm. where we give people out, you know, yeah. with children and all. Mm. But all people are, are the same. T tell me, you had a near escape. Oh, I... Tell us about that. <laughs> well, as I say, like, the escape was in Benghazi, wasn't it? See, we'd gone up the, up the, up the desert and uh, we'd, we'd uh, sort of settled down in... in uh, Durna, the place called Durna. We put up a little shop there and got, got bandaging up, you know. And uh, we were told to get out. That wasn't the first like, time, like, you mm -hmm. know. But we were told to get out there. We had 20 minutes to get out, get some of our stuff up and get get off. That, that was one escape. The other one was when we went out into the desert. Uh, we'd had a message from... Uh, these here, um, what do you call it, uh, aeroplane spotters told to go home. They'd seen a fella waving his hand. I thought, well, there's no, you only went on reference points there, so you never went on little villages or anything like that. You went on reference points. And I went out with a, an RASC driver. See, I never had a gun. I just, you know, I was just had bandages and things like that, morphine and that sort of thing. And um, this particular time, like, you know, he, uh, I don't know, it, it was, uh, it's either you or me. <laughs> mm. That's how it worked out in, in the beginning, when everything was jumbled up, you know. I remember one time, I'm going away from it now. Um, we had a, we, 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 were, we were stuck just outside uh, Billers Bow Cage, it was. It's a little little village on, on, in France, Billers Bow Cage. And there's all trees and everything. And I was detailed to do a bit of gardening. We garden without any, any guns, like, it was funny. People who said, <laughs> used to laugh at us, you know, got no gun, only a stick. <laughs> you couldn't do very much with a stick, could you? No. 
And I was on guard one night and we'd been hammering this here village folk. There's been a big fire there. And it, the, the flames were flickering on the trees in the woods as they were coming out. You know, you could see the flames flickering. Uh, and uh, I, I was... Uh, I had to do the guard, I had to do the guard. And they said, uh, I went, hey, is somebody coming out? What it was, was the flickering of the light in the village, on the trees, giving you the idea that the people were moving around and coming out, you know. And uh, I always remember that. Mm. I woke them up, didn't I, they played hell, didn't I? Ooh, I got I got a real rollick in for that. Going back to Lucky Escapes, did uh, did you not re were you not on the receiving end of a sniper? On the what? On the, the receiving end of a sniper. Did a sniper not try and kill? Oh, you? I. Oh, well, I was on the end, end of that. Uh, I got a bullet on DJ Morning. In me, you know, have, have you ever seen a, a compressed triangular bandage? They're very mm -hmm. tight, mm -hmm. and when they open them out, you know, you can use them for the. Well, I was going along fixing this lather, and uh, I'd been there about oh, 10 minutes or more, and uh, I felt a sharp bang. It spun me round, you know. I thought, what the hell's that like? I had to pack it up. The fellow I was bandaging, I had to sort of leave him for a while. And when I looked, there was a bullet in a triangular bandage, in a compressed triangular bandage. It's the, the bandage saved my life. Oh, mm. I, no doubt about that. That was one escape. Yes. But you have to be very careful where you went. And use the reference points according to the spotter planes, you know. Mm. But the mm. uh, first place we did when we landed anywhere was look for a place to, to operate from, you know. Uh, I mean, yours, uh, yours was a very special job, really. Oh, I was. Uh, you, you had to know what you was doing, like, and you had to try and help people, you know. That was my job. Yes. And I've sort of all cottoned on to it, helping people. Hmm. Yes. But there was a lot of nice people knocking about. I mean, you, you travelled uh, from France into Belgium. Did you travel? I think you, when you, you went from Caen, you went to Belgium, did you? And then on to Germany? Yeah, we went on to Germany, up the, you know, the, the uh, main highways, they call them. They had some smashing roads in Germany, you know. Yes. We, we, we were, we were a, I was wearing a patch on them. You know, mm. there were four roads, and, you know, you could see for miles. And mm. that's how I think he manoeuvred around pretty quick with his, with his, you know, his tanks and things and, and, mm. uh, and, and different uh, vehicles. Oh, I. He, um, he had some smashing railways. And, and roads. Aye. But, um, um, Were there any unpleasant experiences that oh, you had? Oh, I, well, on my job? Yes. Oh, you know, I, I, I was coming across lads with no legs and, you mm. know, little I could do, like only put a bandage on them and let them get back again, you know, as quickly as possible. Yes. We had a CCS casualty clearance station and uh, a first part where you got them, you know, hmm. in the casualty clearance station. And then there was a, a, a you may not believe it, but a, a field hospital. Hmm. They'd done a good job, you know, because, hmm. you, you know, you're only five, ten minutes away from them, you know. They're all... Following up one another, see. We yes. were the field ambulance. Then you yeah. had the uh, CCS. Then you had the uh, hospital. And mm. it all worked, it worked together, you see. Yes. 
And uh, it still happens today, though. I was talking to a fella across the road. And he said, uh, yes, Arthur, he said, it still works on that principle. Hmm. Uh, yes. While you were in Germany, um, I believe your experiences weren't wonderful there, particularly. Well, it was Belson, wasn't it? Right. You know, we uh, we went on to Belson, and we knew mm. that Belson was a bit of a place, you know. And when we got there, it was a bit of a place. Mm. Our leading tank went straight through the Iron Gates. And I went after him, didn't I? I was part and parcel of the forward yes. thrust. Yes. Yeah, they give me two days of just pumping DDT into people. You know, that just bad. To, to clean them up. Just mm. like a earache, you know, mm. skeletons. Dreadful. Anyway, our leading tank rounded them all up and made them all comfortable, you know, made the, the guards and the people that were there, made them look after them, you know, made, made them comfortable. And that went on for a while. And from there, like, you know, it was, it was raging. Mm. But there's nothing he could do. He was on the move, wasn't he? Yes. You know, he didn't. He didn't have time to settle down, so he kept on going. We went going as well. Mm. After after a couple of weeks, you know, got the place sorted out. Mind you, the war was just about to come to an end then, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. Uh, uh, yes, round about that time, and. Uh, Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima, mm. them two places uh, packed up about a fortnight after Japan. That was when you left Germany? No. Oh, oh no. No, I was in oh, Germany when, right. it, when it happened. Oh, right. The war come to an end in Japan Yes. while I was in Germany. Because that was late 1945. Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, we run them all, all up into Denmark. But uh, we had to come from Denmark because uh, it was a neutral country, you see. Yes. So they all come back from there, didn't they? Mm hmm But, uh, it, you know, the army gave me uh, a lot of confidence in myself. I didn't mm. give a bugger for anybody when I, you know, <laughs> after, after it was over. No. No. No, no. But the worst part of it was waiting to get demobbed. You know? I always made a habit of lying in a hole if I could find one. And uh, just lying there at night time with nobody to talk to. And everywhere quiet. No guns going, no suicide. It was a really, really trying time, mm. you know. But uh, that was it. I come back, got, got the mob after about three months. Ward finished like that, hadn't it? And uh, I come home in the post office van. Mm -hmm. I, the the man in Chester. But what we did, we come to Euston, and, and I got from Euston to Chester. Got the mobbed, and then we made our way home, didn't we? Yes. And. Uh, I said to the, you know, the, the fella in the, in the station, just the station, I said, I want to get to Hollywood. Oh, he said, there's no train going to Hollywood, he said. He said, but there's a post office van going in the morning, said two o'clock. <laughs> well, I said, that'll do. <laughs> so I come home in a post office van from, uh, you know, from Chester. Uh, and I bet you got a, a great welcome when you got back. Well, you know, I was glad to see my wife, wasn't I? And yes. And that was a, a big thing, like I hadn't seen her for, you know, a couple of years, had I? Now, just tell me a little bit about that, because you met your wife whilst you were working before the war, is that right? Yeah. And then war interrupted. Well, it interrupted for everybody, didn't it? Mm. You know, you had no qualms or anything, no excuses. You went to uh, went to get your uh, get seen if you were all right, you know, and you were called up, and that was it. Yes. Went for your medical, hmm. and that's how it stood for six and a half years after. 
But you married during the war, didn't you? Well, I found confidence and yes. uh, hell of a lot of confidence. I didn't care, you know, I didn't mm. care for anybody. No. And uh, what I wanted, I, I strived to get. And in the end, like, I managed to get it, what I wanted. But uh, I always come out with the notion that nobody was better than me. <laughs> and, and they weren't were better than anybody else. Like That's, that's how it finished. Is that part of the secret of a long life? Well, I don't know, because uh, I've had a pretty rough life in the beginning, you know. Yes. With having no father and four of us to bring up. Pretty rough. And I, you know, I tried to get little jobs to fill the gap. Mm. You know, my mother used to bake the bread, and I used to take it to get made into loaves in El Ellis the Baker's in Flint. You know, that was one thing, you know. But uh, it's one of them things in it, like. But the, the nicest thing I've ever seen was a smile on the people's faces as we were going through the, the villages and the town. Because yes. they'd been under the hammer for six and a half years. Yes. You know, and they were glad to see us, weren't they? Mm. Uh, but uh, as I say, I was in the medical corps and... Uh, I didn't see much of the fighting there after that. No. I, well, I was dabbling with the casualties, like, you know, still yes. getting casualties. Eh? But uh, everything was all jumbled, so. So, after D-Mob, what happened next? Well, I was asked to go to Chester Royal Infirmary to work there. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd had enough of it, hadn't I? <laughs> Six and a half years of it. So you didn't want to be a doctor? <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to go in, you know. No. I would never have been a doctor, never no. had the qualification, you know. No. But uh, I could do what a doctor did in the way of breaks and, you know, blood clots and all that. Mm. But uh, I do it now, don't I? <laughs> yes. I, I've, I've, a couple of times I've uh, sort of... I know I've run out, I went to Blackpool for holiday the North Shore with Mary, and a fellow got knocked down on his bike about 200 yards away from where I, Mary and I were coming back. I automatically left her. She went to see if he was all right, you know. Yes. And uh, fair enough, like he was using me, I had a big handkerchief, I used it to wrap around him. And, uh, but uh, I've had a, a couple of men, uh, Who's up here with the kids, you know, getting it on the bikes. Mm -hmm. It's surprising how it come to you, you know, you just automatically made it. You but never forget it. Well, you can't, can you? No. So, yeah. no. Mm. Ah. Well, I'm sure I've been knocked off a few times. So, Going over, yeah. carrying people over open ground, you know. You had to do it because there was no reasonable roads. But it never done me any harm. It's uh, done me a lot of good, I think. Mm. You, only, you know, I'm just lucky to be here. I am lucky, yes. no doubt about it. Yes. After, after the, having been offered a job with the, um, with the hospital, you, you, I think you went back to Courtaulds, didn't That's you? That's right. They asked me to go back, so I went back there. And then... Uh, We'd lost a lot of people, you know, hadn't mm. there? A lot of vacant seats there. And uh, I went back to the old job. And then I got promoted, didn't I? Oh. Oh, I got promoted there. <laughs> I was... I used to do the machines, operate the machines, you know, work on them. And uh, I was under the machine with oil on my face doing the sea job. And I could see two... Two pairs of shiny shoes underneath by the machine, you know. I, I couldn't see who was there. Anyway, when I went out, they, they said to me, what are you doing under there? I said, what the hell do you think I'm doing under here? You know, that's how, <laughs> yeah, that, that's how the confidence you had in yourself, yeah. like, you know. Well, we want you off there. Well, who's going to mend this, I said to him. You know, was it like a cam on yeah. it going up and down? Yeah. Anyway, 
Shumë për mund dhe 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 sen. Më nëjë këmë dhe dhe manë gjë, a në falë për më kapë në të dhe, you know. Në që mojë dhe unë dhe dhe, a që dhe më fikse në mëshinë. Well, he said, I want you to go home, the manager. He said, I want you to go home. Well, who's going to do this? I said, you know, that's how, that's the confidence that you're giving yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, well, I want you to go home anyway and put your best suit on. I said, I haven't got a best suit. <laughs> and never had a best suit. I don't have mob suit. You know, they give you, they give you the whole lot, like. They give you a, a suit, the mob suit, a trilby hat. <laughs> and a uh, pair of shoes, stocks. They give you the lot, like, you know. I said, that's all I've got. Well, go, go and put that on, they said, and come back. I thought to myself, this is weird, this. You know, what am I going back to? And I come back and I uh, made me a foreman. And I stuck that uh, all the time I was in court hall. And I reached the senior foreman, and they couldn't get any further, only the manager, like. But I did have, it's funny, you know, I went to Flint the other day, and I met, uh, I met a woman there who I'd been over. I thought, I never thought I'd see this, you know. But uh, I keep see, I've been keeping seeing them over the years, you know, Meg, up and down Flint, because... They're all from Flint and Greenfield and Connie's Key and but uh, there's experience and it's giving you the idea of how people live, you know. But uh, there's a lot of Roman talking about it all, you know. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Out for what they could get, wouldn't they? Mm. You see, with the war being finished, there's a lot of empty spaces. Yes. Uh, and they wanted to fill them empty spaces, didn't they? If they could. But so nothing to do with me, that I, I was off on my own, like, mm. bringing my children up. Yes. Uh, and that's what it's been ever since. On the move, up. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any... I mean, you've told us one or two funny stories. Have you any other funny stories that you might have um, that you might want to tell us? Anything? What any, about what? Uh, well, anything that comes to mind that was was uh, was quite a funny experience. Oh, I, well, I had quite a lot of experiences, really different things, you know. Mm. But so, uh, as I say. The main ones like stand out in your mind, but the others like you sort of forget about them, don't they? Yes. But um, I think that the army taught me a lot of things. Taught me how to look after myself. That was one thing they gave me. And I didn't give a bugger for anybody after they come out. Mm. I just went on living. Would that be your, would that be your philosophy, uh, Arthur? Um, for, I mean, you've had a, a long and very good life. In a, well, good, well, mixed life, I suppose. But what, what would you think is the, if you were to speak to a younger person today, what would be your advice to them? Well, for, I'd say, hold your chin up. Don't let anybody bother you, you know, and uh, just carry on. But carry out what you're told, and uh, that that won't cause any trouble. Yes. I found that by treating people with respect, they'll treat you back with respect, and you get the best out of people. Yes. See? I've always found that. Mm. Yeah. Well... I think we've probably come to an end, but I would like to thank you very much for sharing your memories with Ooh, War Jen. A lot of them. And um, here's to an even longer and happy life. Well, you know, I've 
one of them things, isn't it? You're just lucky to be alive. I am, anyway. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I count myself lucky. Mm. Mm. Because, you know, when, when I... This lad took me to Normandy a couple of years ago, and uh, I went along the graves, like, and I seen some of the names of the lads up in my uni. Uh, you know, and that them are the things that sort of... Uh, you know, make me feel a bit. I went off, didn't I? Mm. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, mm. I Normandy. That that was one of the places I went. But uh, we could have gone again, couldn't we, lad? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Arthur. That's that's great. all right, lad. Uh, yeah. If I can give you any, you know, yeah. memories, because they've gone now, haven't they? Uh, yes, it's all in the past, sadly. But it's um, gone now. Mm. And but, I've had a really speaking, I've had a, a varied life, you know. Yes. I've been at the top and I've been at the bottom, and um, it just comes one of them things in it, like, mm. you know, nearly captured and shot at, and <laughs> and you still survived. Well, I'm still here, you see, and I count yeah. myself lucky, don't I? Yeah, yes, indeed. You know, and not only that, I've seen some parts of the world that I'd never see mm. if, if the war hadn't started. That's true. Like, you know, uh, the top of Mount Etna, you know, Loch Lomond, mm. pyramids, you know, places like that. Yes. Places that I'd seen in school, but I never thought for one moment that I'd be able to see them. Well, thank you very much, Arthur. That's all right, love. Okay. If I can help you, I will. It's always been my nature to help oh, people. Yeah.